Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We'll talk about the notion of changing ring. Okay, so this is called change of ring. And how to make modules over one ring into modules over another. So here's the standard uh, thing one usually wants to do, which is called restriction of scalars. So this is the usual um, sort of thing. If you have a, for example, a, a vector space over the complex numbers is also a vector space over the real numbers, right? You can restrict the scalars to the reals or in fact to a vector space over the rational numbers and so on. So that's one way of thinking about restriction. But the general notion is slightly, uh, slightly more gentle in fact. So suppose I have a ring R. Okay, so, uh, suppose I have R, a ring, not necessarily commutative and suppose I have another ring S. So, I am going to change from R to S okay. and what do I have? I have a ring S together with a ring homomorphism from S to R. Okay, so, suppose I am given this setup, phi is a ring homomorphism from the ring R to the ring S, uh, from the ring S to the ring R. Okay. Then I claim that if I have a module over R, then an R module M can be made into an S module. Okay. Via well, what's the how to how do you do this? To do this, you must define a scalar multiplication, right? M is already an additive group. Uh, so, let us do the following, I take an element S from S and I take an element M from my module and I need to define scalar multiplication S multiplying M. The definition is the following, well what can I do? Since I am given a ring homomorphism, I apply the ring homomorphism to S thereby obtaining an element of the ring R and now M is an R module. So, I know how to scalar multiply M with the scalar phi of s which comes from r right so this is the definition of uh, the scalar multiplication by elements of s and the the thing is it's easy to check the properties okay so one just has to check that all the axioms of a, a module are satisfied uh, let me just check one of them for you and you know you can uh, check the other one so for example if i multiply two elements if I take two scalars S1 and S2 and I look at their product S1, S2. So, S1, S2 acting on M must give me the same answer as S1 acting on S2 acting on M. Right? So, this is one of the axioms. So, let us check that this is true. So, we start with the left hand side S1, S2 acting on M. By definition, you apply phi to S1, S2 and then act on M using the R module structure on M. But now phi is a homomorphism. This is the first place where we need to use it. This is phi s1, phi s2. It's a product of these two guys in M in R, uh, and it's this product acting on M, right? But now the axiom, the, the the corresponding axiom for R module says the product of two scalars of R acting on M is just what you get by acting one after the other. So it's phi s1 acting on phi s2 acting on M. But then that is exactly the right hand side. This by definition is S1 acting on S2 acting on M okay, and so on. So, all the other axioms involve similar verifications. We will need to use all the properties of phi. Phi of S1 plus S2 is phi S1 plus phi S2 as well as phi of 1 equals 1 identity goes to identity. Okay, so, all of these will, will be involved. So, it is easy to, to check all the axioms. So, I leave that for you to check. So, this, this process by which you can make a um, an R module into an S module is called uh, restriction of scalars even though it is slightly more general than the notion of uh, just 
truly restricting scalars. So the standard example of course is the is the canonical res restriction uh, setup. So suppose S is a subring of R in which case I have the inclusion homomorphism. So this map phi is just the inclusion map then an R module automatically becomes an S module by truly honestly restricting scalars right by only acting by elements of S. But this, this general definition is, is nice, it is useful sometimes. So, let me give you an instance of the general definition as well. So, suppose S is the ring K of X, the ring of polynomials and R is just the ring K, the field. So, let us say K is a field in this case. So, I take R to be K and S to be K of X and I define a homomorphism from K X to K. Well, what, what sort of homomorphism? I can take the what is called the evaluation map. Okay, given any polynomial, I evaluate it at some element of the of the field k. For example, I evaluate it at 1 or 0 or other points. Uh, Let us say I evaluate it at 1 in this example. So, here is a map and it is very easy to check that this evaluation map is a ring homomorphism. Now, what does this mean? This means that if I have a k module, which means if I have a vector space, so then a, a k vector space is a module over k, a k vector space uh, m or becomes a module over k x. Well, via what is the action? If we take a polynomial f x, act it on a element of m, by definition I must apply phi to f x and that application of phi is like evaluating f x at 1. So, I, I evaluate, I put x equals 1, I get an element of k and I scalar multiply that element of k on m. Right? So, this was the definition. So, this gives you for example, a, um, uh, I mean this gives you a structure of a k x module on m and of course, we have seen the more general ways of making um, k vector spaces into k x modules. All you have to do is to specify one linear operator. And in this case, this is just uh, you know this is this is just the choice uh, of the linear operator identity here. Okay, so anyway, so uh, this is just to illustrate that uh, this general definition can give you something more interesting than just uh, usual restriction. Now, the the opposite problem is usually called extension of scalars, which is you you have a well, I have a let us say a, a map now from S to R as before a homomorphism, but I have an S module, M is an S module now and I want to see if I can somehow make it into an R module. Okay. So, this is a slightly harder problem, I mean much harder problem, you cannot um, uh, do it in a very easy manner as before because the same argument as before does not work. You, if you take an element of R, uh, there is no easy way of defining scalar multiplication because I cannot convert it into an element of S by applying a homomorphism. The homomorphism goes in the wrong direction. Okay, so there is this. I mean, but there is a way of doing this. It involves tensor products and so on. So we won't get into this right now. But I just want to talk about one special case. Okay, and that special case is is rather. Uh, common and important. So, here is one special case of extension of scalars which is suppose I have S is a ring and I take R to be the ring S modulo i, a quotient of S okay, where i is some two sided ideal. I need to pick a two sided ideal of S. So, the question is if I, if I give you an S module, can I make it into an S, my, S mod i module? Can I make it into a module for the quotient? Okay, so let M be an S module. So the question really is when can M be made into an S by I module? And to answer this, we uh, define the annihilator of M. So here's a definition. So recall you know in other contexts one has talked about annihilators of elements. So, this is an annihilator of a module. So, what is an annihilator of a module? Well, this is all scalars, this is all elements of S which 
kill every element of the module such that SM is 0 for all M in M. Okay, it acts as 0 on the entire module, kills everything. Now, here is a little exercise. This is a ideal annihilator of M is a two sided ideal. of the ring s okay it's an easy verification you just need to check that whether you multiply things on the left or on the right the, the you know the the element continues to be in the annihilator okay? and also that it's closed under addition so it just follows from the definition so the annihilator of a module is a certain two sided ideal of my uh, ring s and so here's the here's the answer to the question when can you make m into an s s by i module so, if i is a two sided ideal, uh, is a two sided ideal of S such that i is contained inside this annihilator, then M becomes uh, S mod i module. via the following definition uh, how do you define so take an element of s mod i what's a typical element look like it's it's a coset right let's call it s bar the coset of uh, s so maybe i'll just write it as a coset s plus i so look at the coset of s s plus i how can i make this act on m well there's only one obvious uh, way to define it i'll just say this is equal to s m okay for all s in s. So, suppose I define it like this. Okay? So, the first thing that one has to check in all these cases is that this is well defined. right? What if I choose a different representative of my coset, will I get the same answer? Okay? So, well definedness is the first property. And that is more or less the only thing to be checked, the others are obvious. So, suppose the same coset has two different representatives. Suppose S1 plus i is equal to S2 plus i for some S1, S2 in S. Okay, what does this mean? This says that their difference S1 minus S2 is in i. Okay, this is another way of saying that S1 minus S2 is in i. Okay? Now, uh, Let us check that I will get the same answer whether I apply S1 or S2, uh, whether I choose S1 or S2 as my representative. Okay. So, observe S1 minus S2 is in i, but i is contained inside the annihilator of M. Okay. What does it mean? It means that S1 minus S2 annihilates every element of the module. M is 0 for all M and M. What does that mean? It says S1 acting on M is the same answer as S2 acting on M for all m and m okay and that's exactly what we wanted to prove right so that completes the proof of well definedness because if you had chosen s1 as your representative you would have gotten s1m if you had chosen s2 you would have gotten s2m but those two are the same answer always okay so this is well defined and then the other axioms are are more or less obvious so i, I will leave the other axioms for you to check of uh, a module if i take a sum uh, of two cosets, then the right hand side becomes a sum, um, you know, or uh, if I take a product, it, it gives you successive actions and so on. Everything follows because, you know, it's finally only depends on the representative. Okay. So, check that the other axioms also work. Okay. And uh, so, this is a, this is a very important and uh, useful proposition. Uh, an example of its use is when you have kx modules. So, suppose v is a k vector space which I make into a kx module. Uh, so, I, uh, recall how do you make this into a kx module? You pick a linear operator, you fix some linear operator on v and you make v into a kx module by saying that uh, how, how do I make a polynomial f x act on a vector v? I just substitute the operator t in place of x. It gives me a new linear operator and it is that operator acting on v. Okay? So, this was the definition for all v. 
So, I have made V into a kx module and now the question is um, well what is what, you know the, the, the whole business of annihilators and so on. So, let us just compute the annihilator of this module. So, here is an interesting. So, what is the annihilator of this module V thought of as a kx module. So, I am doing everything over kx. So, what is the annihilator of V over kx mean? It means it is all those elements. So, all those polynomials in kx which annihilate the whole um, which annihilate the whole module. In other words, which means when I plug in uh, the operator t, it just gives me 0 on every vector. So, this is 0 for all vectors v and v. In other words, the operator f t is actually the 0 operator, right. So, this, this property here uh, can be rephrased to say that f of t is just the 0 operator, ok. Now, uh, observe that. So, we already said the annihilator is an ideal ok and k x is a principal ideal domain which means that this must be a principal ideal right. So, this must be the ideal generated by a single polynomial let us call that polynomial m t of x because it depends on my choice of t and well what what are the properties defining properties of this polynomial. Firstly, this polynomial annihilates x uh, sorry annihilates t when I plug in t I just get the 0 operator and because it is the generator of the ideal it means that among all the polynomials which annihilate t this is the one of the smallest degree for example ok. And if you sort of recall uh, uh, your linear algebra this is exactly what is termed the minimal polynomial of the linear operator t ok. It is exactly this it is the smallest well it is the smallest degree monic polynomial you can also normalize it to have leading coefficient 1. So, the smallest degree monic polynomial which annihilates the the operator t that is exactly the minimal polynomial. So, that is the the annihilator of v thought of as a kx module. So, in fact what this implies is that uh, if I make v into a kx module using my operator t then in fact it is it is more than just a kx module v is actually a module over kx modulo any ideal which is contained in the annihilator okay. in particular it is it is a module over kx modulo the ideal mtx ok and mtx is is the minimal polynomial of t. So, so in some sense things like diagonalizability and many other properties of you know linear algebraic properties sort of come from the, the structure of this ring. So, in you know we will probably do this in one of the examples. So, you have probably seen things like if uh, the minimal polynomial factors into distinct linear factors then the the um, operator is diagonalizable and so on ok. So, we will consider things like that in the uh, problem sessions. Thank you.